Next speaker is Anna Songhurst. Here we go. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I am uh, Dr. Anna Songhurst. I'm from the Ecoexist Project in Botswana. And I'm here today presenting on behalf of my co directors, Dr. Graham McCulloch and Dr. Amanda Stronza, and the rest of the Ecoexist team. So, to start with, I'm going to take you to where we work. Maybe. <laughs> in northern Botswana. Um, it's where uh, the Okavango River comes into Botswana and here we have 15 villages um, settling along the Okavango River and the Okavango Delta. Um, and it's kind of like a ribbon-like development where you have the settlements and then you have fields um, going out from the villages. Um, and there's over 16,000 people here. And the main, uh, the main um, source of livelihood is subsistence agriculture, mostly arable agriculture. So people farming and relying on their fields to feed their families for the year. In the same area, we have over 18,000 elephants. Um, and when we say the same area, I'm talking about an 8,000 square kilometer area where the Namibian border is and there's a northern buffalo fence here. And in this area, the elephants utilize um, the dry land resources up in the north, and then they need to come down to the Okavango River and the Okavango Delta to access water and other natural resources. So in this area, elephants are using distinct pathways to do that in order to get through where the, the um, areas of agricultural land is and settlements. Um, and these are the pathways going out into the Okavango Delta. And here on these pathways and in between, we have direct conflict, um, the contact happening between people and elephants. So there's a lot of direct <coughs> interactions where um, people are getting killed and injured, elephants are getting killed and injured. We also have disturbance um, for the elephants from people and vice versa. In addition, we've got um, areas where the agricultural land is either on or close to big elephant movement pathways. So this is one of those big elephant movement paths. And so this results in a lot of um, crop raiding by elephants. And so I started um, my PhD work back in 2008 and finished in 2011. But during that time, I wanted to understand what were the underlying drivers of the, the problems that were happening here. Okay, there's competition for space. Um, but then what was happening in terms of uh, why were the elephants favoring some fields over others? So I did a big study. And this map shows you um, all of the red dots are fields that were raided by elephants over three years, and all of the green dots, if you can see them, are fields that were not raided. So I monitored all of the fields, over 1,200 fields in the area over three years, using community enumerators to assist to collect the data. And then did a big comparative analysis to try and understand what was it that made an elephant go to one field and not another using different factors like um, social factors, uh, was it the age of the farmer, was it the type of mitigation a farmer was using, um, was it uh, something to do with where the field was located, is it because it was close to water or close to an elephant pathway or close to a village. And so from all of that research came out with, um, and then doing all the statistical analysis and, and 
um, accounting for spatial correlation and all those horrible things, came out with the fact that actually the distance to an elephant pathway was the most robust key driver of the crop ranging in that area. And so from this work, we come up with a map, I mean, a, a, um, sorry, a, a, a graph here to show the probability of raiding. So a field which is um, less than a kilometre from one of these pathways was twice as likely to be raided by an elephant. And then I wanted to understand more about these pathways. Okay, there's lots of pathways in this area, but some are being used more frequently than others. So over three years, we monitored these pathways. And by monitoring, I mean we went and actually went out and we counted footprints. We counted to see how many elephants were passing um, overnight, to see how many herds and how many individuals within a herd, as best you can. Um, and this was done with um, local uh, people who had the knowledge of how to identify footprints. And we also then digitized this onto um, maps. And then we verified those maps going back to the communities to get the, the traditional knowledge on where the elephants were moving. And so from this, we managed to find that there was over 106 pathways. All these lines are the paths that the elephants used to get from the, the dry lands down to the Okavango. But what we found was that they really were using some more than others. So the, the ones that were mo less frequently used are the blue lines. And then those that are more frequently used were the orange lines. And then there was one path which was used most frequently of all, which is this red line. So then um, did a lot of data analysis on that to try and understand, well, why is it that some paths are being used more frequently than others? And for that, we used generalized linear models. Um, and we, we looked at, okay, was it the fact that it was close to villages? Did the amount of agricultural land have anything to do with it? Looking at different factors. And from that, it came out that it really did seem to see, be that the elephants, their movements and their behavior is really being affected by the people that are living there. So we found that less elephant groups were observed close to human habitation, um, such as cultivated lands and settlements. We found that those paths where um, there were uh, less people um, were more likely to be used by elephants. But when, when um, pathways are being used in agricultural lands, there might, the, the number of elephants within a herd increase. So what this um, indicates is that actually the elephants' behavior in this area are responding to risk. So in areas where there's more risk associated where they have to move, they could be bunching together. You know, to try and get through those areas where there's more disturbance because they're coming through the agricultural lands. So they're adopting a safety and number strategy when moving through these areas. And they're also avoiding some places because of the, the presence of people or the number of people in the area. So then, after doing all of this research and having all this data, try to think about, okay, well, how can this data be useful? How can we use this data to try and actually address human elephant conflict and find ways to manage it? And then in... 2013, we um, had the opportunity to, to establish the EcoExist project and, and run a five-year program to try and do this. And one aspect of this was that we, we had the opportunity to start collaborating with Tawana Landboard. So that's the land authority for this area of Botswana. Um, and, and with USAID SARAP program that was working in the area as well. And we were asked to incorporate this data on the crop grading and on the um, pathway monitoring into a land use planning um, identification strategy. So sorry, it's the land use conflict identification strategy called LUCIS. And what this is, is it's a GIS um, based model, but it's really powerful because it not only takes all the data that's available on current land use and soil quality, and um, it also takes in people's opinions. So it, it involves a lot of stakeholder consultations from government to people living within the communities. And all of that is incorporated into this modeling. So what comes out from this is that you come out with a land use plan where you've got areas which are oops, um, highly appropriate for future developments. So you're thinking about where the settlements need to develop. You come out with areas which are suitable for agricultural developments, so where there's good agricultural soils. And you can also come out then with areas which should be set aside for wildlife. And in this case, particularly elephants, because it's one of the major land use conflicts in the area. And so out of all of this, came out with a, um, a map showing we've got 13 elephant corridors now identified into this land use planning in the area. And so these 13 <coughs> corridors are pretty much those, those orange and red lines that you saw on the previous map. 
It doesn't incorporate all of the elephant movement paths, but it incorporates all of the really, really highly frequently used paths um, that the elephants are using, and some of them are grouped together. And so some of these corridors, um, they range from two kilometers wide to four and a half kilometers wide, and they all extend back nine kilometers because this is the development zone within the area which the, which the land board has authority over. So this now um, also shows areas, the green ones show where there's good agricultural soils for future agricultural development. And now the land board will not allocate any future fields in these elephant <coughs> corridors. And this is just a close-up, you can see more detail here. So here the orange shows where there's a settlement and then it shows you where you can have um, village expansion. And then you've got the areas where there could be future arable um, land allocated and then you have areas where there's um, the elephant corridors. And so through this whole process, community participation was critical. And not only through the process of the land use planning, but also afterwards and going back and making sure that people agreed with, with those maps. Um, so we spent a lot of time out with the land overseers and the communities, the village chiefs, um, presenting at village meetings. Um, and now it's in the implementation stage. So we're now at the stage where the land board has also gone back out and, and made sure that these uh, elephant corridors are in the places that they should be. Um, and they will be demarcated with elephant corridor signs. And now the elephants are utilising the corridors, which is really nice of them. <laughs> and, um, um, but we're at the stage now where the land board is um, ready to start allocating um, the, la the new arable land. So we, we still can't, we don't have the data yet on how, ma how many fields have been allocated outside of corridors yet, but we're at that stage now. Um, and so linking these small scale movement corridors is critical. For I think Brian Jones um, spoke about it earlier this morning. With these uh, big wildlife migratory corridors in Kaza, if you don't have these small movement corridors going through areas where there's agricultural lands, where there's people living, then those huge, big wildlife migratory corridors for connectivity won't work. Um, and community acceptance of those is key. And then we come on to addressing human elephant conflict or trying to get to human elephant coexistence. And appropriate land use planning is just, just the start, but it is a fundamental start. But in order to reduce the conflict, it needs to coincide with lots of other strategies on top. And so what EcoExist is doing, we have a whole holistic approach to addressing um, conflict or promoting coexistence. And that involves um, looking at uh, improving short-term strategies for human elephant conflict management. So we're talking about what are the immediate needs of a farmer? How does a farmer stop an elephant getting into their field? Things like tilly deterrence, um, using community tilly plots to make that more sustainable, thinking about um, mitigation techniques on a landscape level, uh, solar fencing around a cluster field area um, which is outside of an elephant corridor, things like that. Um, we work with community officers, so we have ears, eyes and a voice in every single village that we work in. And they liaise with us on issues that are coming up in the village and also they can take information back from us. And that helps us to address underlying issues that can exacerbate conflict, things like human-human conflicts and things so that we can start to address those as well. And we also think about safety um, of people around elephants in the area and we've been doing a lot of safety around elephant workshops where local experts come and they, they actually teach their own village and their own community about how to be safe around elephants. Um, okay, and then um, we're also addressing um, the underlying driver where people are really vulnerable in this area. Their main livelihood strategy is subsistence arable farming and we've got Kalahari sands, we've got erratic rainfall, it's really hard to grow crops anyway. And so we're looking at how can we make farmers less vulnerable to the effects of crop trading. Because if you're vulnerable anyway, and then an elephant comes in and destroys your whole field overnight, then you know, it's a disaster. So we're working on things to do with conservation agriculture, looking at um, how can you grow better yields in smaller areas which can be more easily protected from elephants. But also, using conservation agriculture will enable people to stay within a cluster field area that has been <coughs> allocated, that is then fenced and protected from elephants, which is outside of an elephant corridor. This will enable people to stay there rather than having to move because they need to get better soils, um, better nutrients in their soils because they've exacerbated the soils. So a lot of our work, we do that. We've, um, we've had great success in CA implementation. Um, we've got over 70 farmers doing it now, and the yields, um, some of them have, uh, they've, they've gained like 
um, 10 times their average harvest in some of the crop types. So it's been amazing results. And on top of that, another big issue in human elephant conflict or human wildlife conflict is where you're living with wildlife, it's causing you big problems, you're not getting any benefits back. So we really are trying to see how we can increase benefits coming to people from living with elephants. Trying to get rid of these negative perceptions towards elephants. So we're doing things like, in Botswana, it's all non-consumptive benefits that have to come back to people. So we're looking at ways to diversify tourism products, um, come and experience what it's like to live with elephants. Um, developing elephant-themed crafts, basket weavers. Um, we've got a, a corporation now up in our area which they specifically have designed an elephant basket. We do annual cultural festivals where people get to celebrate life with elephants and they do cultural performances and competitions with their poetry and dance. Um, and also developing a marketing agricultural product. So trying to encourage people to do what we're trying to, to say is the answer farm outside of elephant corridors, in an area that can be protected by elephants, using conservation agriculture, then that produce that comes from those fields, that can be marketed as elephant-aware produce. That can be bringing even more benefits back to people because they're living with elephants. Even, and they can still do their farming like they want to do, and they can still feed their families, but any excess crop that comes out can then be marketed as elephant-aware. So it's all related in this big holistic strategy. And on top of all of that, <laughs> we're also making sure that we understand more about the elephants and human-elephant conflicts. So we have a big research program. We have nine students. Two of them are here today and will be presenting later. Um, and we do aerial surveys to monitor the elephant population in our area. Um, and we've also fitted um, over 40 satellite collars within the eastern and the western of Rango Panhandle. And this is to look at um, management issues of the elephants in the area, thinking about what effect fences are having on movement, thinking about um, the big casa, um, connectivity issues and big wildlife um, excuse me, corridors, um, and also then using that data to look at these micro-level corridors, these corridors that we've identified, and monitoring to see how they're working in terms of elephants utilising them. Um, this just briefly says that our approach to a very evidence-based, participatory, um, we tackle the immediate needs as well as um, the long-term drivers of human elephant conflict. And ultimately, we aim to inform future human elephant conflict management strategies and related policy and create an enabling environment to allow humans and elephants to coexist. And that's our team. It's not just me. <laughs> and there. Thank you very much. Okay, so we've got uh, just under four minutes worth of question time. Uh, is one of the <coughs> mitigation measures for mitigating human elephant conflicts is, uh, I mean, in your presentation, you have shown out uh, is uh, chili fans. How effective are they? Because there are some critics regarding you can put your chili fence, but when lanes come, to being washed away, so how effective is it? Um, yeah, it's, uh, chili, chili fences are very effective. Farmers that use them and use them properly think they work. Um, but they take a lot of maintenance. So if it rains, then you have to reapply the chili. Um, it's, a lot, it's quite labor intensive. Um, and we've also found that one of the biggest issues we have in Botswana is there's no local supply of chili. So we're having to import it, which is not sustainable. That's why we've taken the approach of trying to establish community chili plots to okay. enable there to be a local okay. supply. But if it's used properly, then yes. Okay. And we've even had some research which showed that um, it can even affect the, the movement trajectory of elephants. Okay. So it could be used as a tool to say, um, kind of to try and persuade elephants to stay on corridors, for example. Okay. Could be, but it would need a lot of chili. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Here and then at the back. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Beth Terry. I um, lived and worked in the Delta area on the west side um, in Etsukabari, Nokane, and w also worked in the same area that Anna and Graham had been working in. And I just wanted to say that in, in 1982, 
1987, we, n we never saw any elephants in that whole side of the delta, the west and the north side. Only one time did we see footprints um, in Etza 1 on the, on the road to Etza uh, 6. But the, my question for you, Anna, is um, what's happening with the impact of, the, of this many elephants on the basket makers and the raw materials used in basket making, including the Hyphene Pichisiana and the, the two, three, four different bark materials. Is there any impact? Is there any um, avoidance tactics of the women who are going out to collect the materials? Thank you. Okay, so thanks, Beth. Um, yeah, it's true. In this area, elephants really started to be seen around um, 95, is what people say. That's when elephants really started to come in. And then um, from monitoring them, they're increasing at a rapid rate in the, in the eastern panhandle, for sure. Like, we, we worked out about 9% a year, which, which is quite crazy. So they're coming in from other areas to this area. Um, but in terms of the um, palm trees and kind of conflict between the women and, and elephants, I think um, we haven't done any kind of um, quantitative research on, on that, but all I would say is that the women have started to adapt to it, so they have their own strategies on how to be safe when they go out. You know, they go out in, in groups or, um, you know, these elephant safety workshops were really revealing actually because people got a chance to share their stories about how they react around elephants and, and the women have all sorts of different tactics on how to be um, safe. You know, if they're out in the middle of a flock lane and they see elephants, they all pretend to be logs lying on the ground, things like that. So they have their own ways of coping, but it's something that needs to be monitored for sure. Great, thank you.